All right, so I was asked to talk about lifestyle factors in pain and a particular chronic pain. And I want to start out by talking about, you know, Dean Ornish in 1993 got the medical field interested in lifestyle. And uh, he was interested in cardiac health and had some famous studies about uh, lifestyle impacting uh, uh, longevity and outcomes with cardiac health. And Bill Clinton, the president, uh, endorsed his, his practice and, and it really became popular and the evidence is strong for the effectiveness of lifestyle and cardiac health. And so lifestyle factors in chronic pain is kind of a newer field. And I'm not an expert at this by any means. You know, I'm kind of impinging on Julianne Sweeney and, and Nick and Ed and chiropractics uh, and their practice, but hopefully they'll chime in. And if you have any questions while I'm talking, please just uh, feel free to ask as we go along. Okay, next slide. All right, so there's a battle for the health and fitness of the world. You know, uh, unfortunately, uh, well-being is kind of, particularly in West Virginia, we know that well-being assessments are particularly low and uh, have been considered kind of the lowest uh, in the country. And, uh, you know, it's a big problem for the general health and well-being of the world, in fact. So uh, lifestyle becomes an important factor in, in considering this. Next slide. So there's four main areas of lifestyle. We've got diet, uh, physical activity, sleep, and mindset. And of course, as a psychiatrist, mindset is what I'm gonna be most expert at, and, and, uh, but I, I've explored other areas. In, in psychiatry, diet has become important, and we have something called nutritional psychiatry now which is looking at dietary factors and, and mental health. And uh, these four things also play a role in pain, which I'm gonna talk about. Uh, so uh, next slide. So of course we all know that the prevalence of chronic pain is higher for those with a higher BMI. Uh, you know, people who hold more weight, uh, put weight on their lower extremities and their knees and their back. And so pain is higher with a higher BMI. But also there's recently been some evidence that inflammatory foods increase pain. And so we're talking about sweets and fried foods and dairy products uh, and, saturated and trans, saturated fats and trans uh, fatty acids. And so uh, it's better to eat an anti-inflammatory diet. And, uh, and, and avoid the chronic low level inflammation. And so uh, the Mediterranean diet is kind of the key to this anti-inflammatory diet. And so what does that involve? Well, so if you think of like olive oil and vegetables, and then of course no trans fats and avoid sweets, and, they, and eating cold water fish three times a week. And so we wanna have fish in our diet with high, high in omega-3 fatty acids. And the Mediterranean diet is considered one of the best diets for people in general, but it's also important in people who have pain because the, of the belief that inflammation is playing a role in the, in the experience of pain. And so other things like fruits and avocado and nuts and seeds and legumes are all part of this diet. And uh, I, I know Amanda Pratt is knowledgeable. She's a dietitian at the, at the Center for Integrated Pain Management. And, spoke with me about the importance of a, a Mediterranean diet. Okay, next slide. So we may discover that inflammation con contributes to disease in unanticipated ways. And so we're just starting to kind of uncover how much of a role inflammation plays. And we may target inflammation with medications ultimately, but right now we mostly can impact it through diet. So, uh, it's an important part of a lifestyle. All right, next slide. So I have a little humor in this dude about diet. It says I went on a three week diet and lost 21 days. So uh, you don't wanna lose days with a diet, you wanna lose you know, body mass or, anyway, a little sense of humor. Next slide. So what about pain and movement? Well, movement enhances well being. we all know that. People who are in pain often think that they need to wait until the pain is gone before they start moving. And some people avoid physical activity out of fear of causing harm. So when people experience pain, they 
they feel that there's some kind of harm that's been done. And you get that c catastrophic thinking about how pain is associated with damage. And so physical activity may be limited because of that. But we also know that a sedentary lifestyle leads to and exacerbates pain. And also you know, physical activity prevents uh, weight gain and obesity. And uh, in the absence of exercise, people atrophy and kind of just wither away. So physical activity is so important. And we know that regular exercise helps with muscle strength and joint structure and joint function. Uh, it improves bone mass in adults. And uh, musculoskeletal injuries during physical activity are preventable by gradually working up to the, to the desired level of, of activity and avoiding excessive amounts of activity. Next slide. So here's a U-shaped curve looking at the intensity of activity and the risk of low back pain. And so you get in trouble when there's low levels of activity or when there's very high levels of activity. And so you want to keep that kind of U-shaped curve in mind. There's kind of a sweet spot about how much activity is appropriate for uh, the best health and the lowest incidence of pain. Next slide. So what kind of guidance do we have about physical activity? Well, this goes back all the way to 1996 when the Surgeon General re report on physical activity and health made recommendations, and they said 30 minutes of physical activity of moderate intensity, like brisk walking on most, if not all, days of the week. And the, if you engage in physical activity that's more vigorous or for longer durations, that'll give you greater health benefits. Uh, sedentary people should start with short durations of moderate intense activity and gradually increase the intensity and the duration. And uh, you should avoid uh, starting an intense physical activity program uh, without guidance from a physician if you have cardiovascular disease or obesity or diabetes, uh, any kind of serious illness that would warrant kind of screening from a physician. And then they also recommended that men over age 40 and women over age 50 consult a, consult a physician before starting a vigorous activity program. And so looking at the next slide here, so this is more recent recommendations, and this comes from the American College of Sports Medicine, but actually the, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services has kind of similar recommendations. And so what they're saying for adults and older adults is 150 minutes of physical activity uh, a week. And so that's like 30 minutes of activity uh, five days a week. And so uh, you know, it's close to what they were saying back in 1996. Uh, and then uh, for people who have limited physical ability from the, the weight bearing activities, you can use cycling with a stationary bike or aquatic exercise. And uh, walking is the most common type of physical activity that people involve themselves in. And then they also recommend two days per week at least of resistance training or strength training exercise. And you want to start out with a light intensity and, and gradually work up to moderate intensity and more exercise. And, and they have specific recommendations. They also say that you should have a warm up and cool down period with physical exercise. So you don't want to just jump into an intense level of activity because that's when you get musculoskeletal injuries. And a cool down is important for your cardiac health. So you don't want to just stop and then you know, resume normal activity of life. Uh, let me think what else. Um, so people who are obese or overweight, they recommend progressing to 250 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. So, uh, you know, it plays an important role uh, in pain relief and there's some guidance about what people do. You know, as we get older, we, we become less and less active you know, our lifestyles just don't tend to be centered around physical activity. And so you have to make a concerted effort to include it in your life. All right, next slide. So here's some famous sayings going all the way back to Thomas Jefferson. He said, if the body be feeble, the mind will not be strong. Uh, one gets the sense of power through fitness. And Gloria Steinem said, empowerment begins in the muscles. So there's even a psychological kind of benefit from physical exercise. Both aerobic exercise can help with mood and, 
and anxiety and physical, uh, like a strength training exercise improves confidence. And so mental health is impacted, but also pain is impacted by physical activity. Okay, next slide. So here's kind of the wrong attitude about exercise. It says, every time I feel like exercising, I lie down until the feeling goes away. So you don't want to have that attitude. That's the, that's the wrong philosophy. Next slide. So what about sleep and pain? So first of all, you've all heard of the sleep drive. So we kind of accumulate a sleep drive through wakeful periods. And it's estimated that you need eight hours of sleep to fully discharge that sleep drive. And so the best way to gauge if you're getting enough sleep is if you feel sleepy during the day. So if you feel tired during the day, you're not getting enough sleep at night. And uh, sleeping a few hours uh, can affect your attention, behavior, learning problems. It increases the risk of accidents, injuries, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and depression. And of course, obesity leads to more physical pain. So sleep plays a role in pain perception. And we know that if people sleep well, their pain the next day tends to be reduced. And people who are having problems with sleep tend to experience more pain the next day. So sleep plays a role. And so the goal is to have satisfaction with sleep, no daytime napping, uh, no sleep-wake cycle problems or fatigue during the day, no complaints of snoring from a bed partner. Uh, sleep quality through balance is the key, not too much or not too little. And uh, you need to have replenishing sleep for a healthy life. So we don't know all the functions of sleep, but we know the outcomes. The military did important research about sleep and sleep deprivation and the effects of sleep on functioning. And we know that uh, decrements in the quality and, and period of time that people sleep has a big impact on functioning. And that, physicians know about this too from being on call, you know, that when your sleep is diminished, that it affects kind of your, your quality of functioning at work. So it's, it's important to get uh, sleep for your, your well-being as well as to reduce pain. All right, next slide. So how about mindset and chronic pain? Uh, so things like negative emotions, anger, anxiety can amplify the experience of pain and a positive outlook can ease it. And so I'm going to talk about uh, kind of mindset. So, um, you know, optimism is super important in mental health. It lowers cortisol production, improves immune function, and reduces risk of chronic diseases. And uh, optimism uh, helps people kind of pull through adversity. So if, if somebody can look at things and kind of with a hope, uh, uh, you know, a stubborn hope and an optimistic attitude, they're going to kind of continue working towards goals and, 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 and pursue their, their wishes and, and hopes, uh, whereas pessimism kind of leads to kind of giving up and, uh, and just uh, quitting. And so pessimism kind of puts a ceiling on one's potential. Now that I'm, not, I'm not sure why I put the love part in here in, in, the, in all the stuff about optimism, but love naturally kills pain also. And so connections are so important. And, in the experience of pain and having kind of an attitude of, of warmth and love toward people eases pain. Next slide. So how about stress and pain? So uh, stress and poor distress tolerance play an important role in the maintenance of pain. And uh, if you can quiet the fear circuitry or, or what we call the harm alarm, that eases pain. And so that gets to that catastrophic thinking process that occurs in people where they, they're kind of worried about the harm that's occurring when they're experiencing pain. And if they can challenge that and not uh, kind of accept that pain is necessarily associated with harm and quell that kind of fear, uh, pain is reduced. And, and so stress, stress recovery is the new fitness. In sports psychology, you, know, you think of fitness like uh, having endurance and strength and, and uh, uh, those sort of things in fitness, but stress recovery is the new fitness, and it's your ability to unwind, have unwinding routines after stressful events. And that plays an important role in the experience of pain. And so 
people who have pain need to have unwinding routines that are healthy. And so I'm an addiction specialist. We see a lot of people with addictions who get into trouble with substances because they're using it to unwind. You know, they find that uh, they relax when they're under the influence of a substance, but it becomes a vicious cycle with all the consequences of use and the loss of control. So also stress is managed uh, and distress is managed with coping skills, resilience, and mental toughness. And so coping skills can be things like meditation or humor or sublimation, which is channeling your stressful life events into positive outlets. Uh, um, compartmentalization, like getting things and kind of nudged away into other areas so you don't focus on stressful events so much. And then resilience is kind of like a bamboo plant. In a, in a terrible storm, uh, the bamboo bends over all the way to the ground. And then when the storm is over, it bounces back up to vertical. And so resilience is so important in, in uh, responding to, to stress and to eliminate uh, or to reduce the experience of pain. So when people kind of get uh, knocked over by their stressful events, and don't bounce back, uh, pain can, can be exacerbated. And then mental toughness, you think about the stoic kind of person uh, who can just deal with pain in, in kind of a resistant way and, and not be troubled by pain. They have a mental toughness. And mental toughness comes from a couple of things. One thing it comes from is visualization. So when people visualize success and positive outcomes, uh, it tends to make you tougher. And also the language that people use, you know, that if you, if you, your self-talk is encouraging and positive and supportive and, and you believe what you say to yourself as being, uh, you know, reasonable, uh, it makes you tougher. Whereas if your language is kind of negative and pessimistic and, and not expecting things to work out, that pulls you down and pain gets exacerbated. Now, the last thing about overcoming stress you know, when somebody experiences a terrible, difficult situation and they tackle it successfully, you know, they, go, they overcome this impossible challenge, uh, it gives them a new psychological frame for the future. And so when people go through stressful events, I, I kind of look at stress as like an inoculation. And so if somebody goes through a stressful event and it's miserable and they hate it and it's difficult, you know, they get through it, but it was awful. But then the next time something stressful comes up, they're like, oh, that's not so bad. I've been through so much. And so they're kind of resilient. And so reframing stress in that way, that it's kind of like a, an inoculation, like a, like a flu shot, uh, can change their frame or their, their mental set, their mindset, and makes them more resilient to the, the effects of pain. Next slide. So why do these lifestyle factors impact pain? You know, what's going on biologically? And I would argue maybe the most likely reason is epigenetics. And so epigenetics are the way that we influence how genes are expressed. And so you can have identical twins who have the same genes and yet one twin is obese and the other one is thin and fit. Or one has schizophrenia and the other one is, has no mental health problems. And so we know that genes can be impacted by environmental things, but also lifestyle impacts the way genetics are expressed. And basically it's promoters being turned on, turned on or turned off by factors that are coming through the lifestyle. And one gene can impact another. And so one thing we can look at is kind of sensitive genotypes. You know, are some people genetically more sensitive to pain? And so it's kind of like an orchid versus a dandelion. You know, if you think of the genetics of an orchid, these are very delicate. I don't know if you guys grow plants. I like plants. But orchids are hard to kind of keep alive and grow flowers. and They're just tough. And dandelions grow under any circumstance. And so I think people have genetics related to pain in the same way. And so we want to intervene with what they're experiencing epigenetically. Okay, next slide. So what are my recommendations as an addiction psychiatrist for lifestyle optimization? Well, I actually look toward Maslow's hierarchy of needs and say maybe we should be thinking about lifestyle in terms of the hierarchy of needs. And so you're probably going way back to college or, 
I, I don't even remember if they talked about that in medical school or you know, in, in medical training. But uh, so what are the, the hierarchy of needs? So first you've got the physiologic needs and then and, and Maslow's principles were that if you got through these, this hierarchy of needs, you reach what's called self-actualization. And self-actualization is like a, the ultimate growth state for a person to be in. And so the physiologic needs are like food and water and breathing and physical activity and sleeping. And the safety needs, of course, like with coronavirus, we're thinking about safety needs now. And belongingness and love needs and then esteem needs. And then cognitive needs like your mindset and your general understanding of the world. And then lastly, aesthetic needs. And so how does this figure into lifestyle? So let's look at the next slide. Next slide. There we go. All right, so the physiologic needs, so you'd want to have good nutrition, you want to exercise or have physical activity and movement. Um, stress recovery is important, breathing exercises and rest. So those are all kind of physiologic level needs. And so you want your lifestyle to include that. And then you want to address safety needs through lifestyle. So driving safely, avoiding falls, not smoking, uh, not using dangerous drugs and excessive alcohol exercise and recreation safety, uh, emotional security, financial security. So all those are kind of safety, safety needs. And then you have belongingness and love needs. So one should build lifestyle approaches with group meals and dating and social networking. And you know, and as we have social distancing with coronavirus, so we want to still connect online like we're doing now, you know, to connect this way. And so belongingness and love needs can be met through online connections. And then esteem needs, so we can devote time to work on talents every day. And cognitive needs, uh, we could add reading and schooling and educational video watching to lifestyle uh, to enhance co our cognitive capacities. And then aesthetic needs could uh, be built into lifestyle by building beauty into lifestyle. And so I think that's kind of the ultimate, that, this is my own kind of theory, so it's not something that's in the literature, but I think it should be, you know, that it kind of makes the most sense that lifestyle is maybe not just about those four things, you know, diet, physical activity, uh, sleep, and mindset, but maybe a whole Maslow kind of hierarchy of needs that can be met through lifestyle. All right, next slide. So I like the term lifestyle abuse. You know, in addictions, they're moving away from abuse. We have disorders like uh, cocaine use disorder, not cocaine abuse. But I think people kind of have abusive lifestyles. And so we want to eliminate what are the abusive lifestyles that people with pain are living in? And how do we do that? Well, there's basically two things that we can do. One is motivational interviewing. You guys have all heard of this, I'm sure. But so when you work with patients, you want to express empathy. You want to develop a discrepancy between where their life is now and where they want it to be. You want to roll with resistance and support self-efficacy so they believe that they can accomplish living a different kind of lifestyle. And it's really, it's a significant change in the way that people are living, you know, that the, the normative behavior of society is not necessarily a healthy lifestyle. And then, and then when it comes to pain in particular, we want to have individual tailored multimodal interventions. So for people who have pain conditions, physical activity needs to be tailored to their particular needs. Diet needs to be tailored to the needs of the individual. And uh, so, you, so we need to have multimodal and you want to have an approach that includes all these different aspects of lifestyle to, to uh, treat these people through lifestyle medicine. So, so a multimodal approach is more effective than a single modal intervention. So that's basically what I wanted to talk about. Uh, any questions? Yeah, hey, Dr. Hersler, it's Charlie. Listen, I think the obvious, quite, that was a nice, presentation, but the obvious question is how is the COVID-19 pandemic going to affect um, what we see in this country regarding chronic pain and addiction? I mean, we're going to see the spike that you might with COVID. Um, I mean, that would be the, the assumption, but you hate to make assumption, but I, but I can see a lot of 
um, advances that we have made sort of going in the opposite direction just because of the stress that everybody is under at this point in time. So I'd be curious to, to hear your thoughts about how this is going to influence, let's say, chronic pain as well as addiction moving forward. Well, so I, I do a lot of work in addiction and it, it's impacting it already. So people are stressed and they don't have good stress recovery skills. So that they don't have ways to unwind. They think of unwinding with a substance. They're bored because places are closed that they would ordinarily go to. AA and NA meetings are shutting down because they don't want people to meet in groups of people. Uh, so our whole system is kind of not working well now uh, with the coronavirus. And so it is a challenge in the addictions field. Sometimes when, when you have a crisis though, it gives something for people to rally around and uh, it, it, it gives purpose to life in a different way. And some of these people really lack a, a deep sense of purpose in their life. And so, you know, taking care of themselves becomes more important and, uh, you know, kind of thinking about the value of life and just what purpose, you know, can be generated from a crisis like this. And so it, it, it works in multiple ways, I guess. And then I guess from a chronic pain standpoint, so people are gonna be more sedentary. It's harder to do things in groups and, uh, and uh, places like gyms where people may ordinarily work out or uh, if they're going to the mall, you know, all this kind of behavior is gonna be limited uh, by fear of being in public and around other people. So I think it plays a role in pain also. Yeah, thank you. A question, Dr. Herschler, about whether there's any particular information that you, any written sources or web sources that you steer patients to for information regarding the importance of exercise and that sort of thing. Because sometimes it's nice to have something to, you know, put in the person's hand. I can talk till I'm blue in the face, but. Yeah, so there are websites that have all kinds of information about healthy fitness and exercise. And uh, so, uh, I, I don't direct people to it. I mostly talk about what I recommend and encourage them to meet with a trainer of some kind if they have no knowledge. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's accessible in your community. Maybe, maybe uh, uh, Julianne could answer that better than I could. What do you think, Julianne? Are there is there guidance on the online for people? If you need generalized. Um, like information to kind of hand out. A good source is the U.S. Department of uh, Health and Human Services. I mean, it's a pretty not over your head, I guess. Their 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 writings and their articles are not over anybody's head. You know what I mean? You don't need an MD or anything behind your name to kind of understand the language that they're using. So it's nice for the general public to be able to kind of um, touch base with that type of website. Um, as think, far as video conferencing, there's a lot of PT places that do video, um, exercise treatments with people. Um, most people do have access to that. So with today's day and age and technology, um, but there's a lot of gyms recently with this whole thing with COVID-19 that are actually releasing daily, um, exercise plans um, to their clients or membership um, clients that uh, that they have access to as well so that they're not doing the same old thing all the time either. So there's there are resources out there. Yeah, I know Michelle Obama, when, when Barack Obama was president, was so invested in the fitness and health of the general population. And I know she had like a Get Fit website or what was her website? I can't remember what it was called. Okay. I think it is get fit. I thought it was called that, but this, so I don't know if that's still available, but that used to be online. I had a, a I don't know if it's a question or a comment, a couple different things actually. Um, one was kind of a question for the group, I suppose, about the best way to get patient buy-in really for these things. We talk about it a lot in the endocrine echo, um, how it's, you know, frequently a struggle to get people with diabetes in that under control um, because of diet and fitness issues or however. Has anybody found like a really amazing way to get through to your patients about that? 
<laughs> no, <laughs> I know. I think one one way that's helpful is to meet somebody who has a story. Yeah, I, I think that's true for all illnesses, actually, that if somebody can meet somebody who has the illness that they have and have pulled their health around and they hear how that, that's kind of like the Alcoholic Anonymous kind of philosophy about approaching health issues. But it makes sense for, it, may, it makes it believable that you can get better. And, and so a physician can kind of tell someone, you know, this is what I advise. But when they meet somebody who has a story like theirs, and uh, and they see how much better they're doing and how fit they look, and they want to hear, well, what'd you do, and how, how you know what motivated you? Yeah, I think persistence helps too. I mean, you just have to make sure you're on message every time you talk to them. Um, and you know, it, if you be really encouraging when you see the least little bit of progress. Yeah. Absolutely. I had another thought, um, Dr. Herschler. I'm sorry, I can't remember if you were at the meeting recently, but there was recently a, a Coke group meeting um, conference thing, and Dr. Josh Carter spoke about mindfulness, and he did some exercises with mindfulness. And of course, they work with um, the addiction populations and stuff like that. But it really, it was interesting. And I was just wondering the way we kind of talk about like acupuncture and other holistic medicines for chronic pain, if any mindfulness might be helpful. Definitely, yes. So there's something in Harvard called the, uh, the Stress Reduction Clinic or something like that, that John Kabat-Zinn is in charge of at Mass General Hospital. And he's written some books. There's a book called Full Catastrophe Living which is about the stress reduction clinic that they have. And they, they have people there, not just with chronic pain, but other conditions as well. And they use mindfulness And it. What happens with mindfulness is someone becomes detached in some ways. So when, when people experience pain, they get engulfed in what they're experiencing. And uh, so mindfulness teaches through a practice how to be an observer to things instead of being absorbed and engulfed in it. And that, that detachment uh, gives you kind of a nice, uh, uh, you know, it detaches from the intensity of the emotions. And that works for all kinds of emotions, not just pain, but any stressful emotion or intense anger or anything like that. You know, being detached kind of gives you a sense of control over it. Very cool. Yep, sure will, Dr. Rexford. Uh, anybody else, any questions, comments about uh, Dr. Herschler's presentation, which we thank you for. That was wonderful. Um, or anything else, anything else you'd like to bring up today? All right. <laughs> All right, everybody. So as I said before, this is our last one for a little while. I will be working with and talking with the hub members to get a curriculum built out, but because this is based around our primary care and what the rural populations really need, I would love for if you guys have something you want to hear about. Again, we're going to restructure it. I don't have a title yet, but think multidisciplinary pain management instead of chronic pain. Um, and we will readjourn in July, and I will send all of that out in an email. So just email me any thoughts you have. Um, I know a couple of people are worried about losing this time. They've really enjoyed the time and I know there's gonna be a couple of months lapse. I am working to try and figure out something to put in the time if I can. I know last year we had a lupus uh, series or something going on. If I find something to fit into this time, I will. Um, we have a metabolic health group of physicians that meets and if I can somehow work that into this, I, I will. So I'll keep you all updated on that. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Take care. Wash your hands. Yeah. <laughs>